Okay, so let's uh, let's wrap up our lecture here. This is our third part about the impacts of humans on the marine environment or the marine ecosystem. We were talking about in the last two lectures, you know, things we're doing to the marine ecosystem and ways that we're impacting it. Unfortunately, for the most part, it's negative. I do want to show you some positive. So, so let's let's leave on a high note. Let's leave on a positive note here. But when we talk about all these things we're doing, what this does is this is pushing species towards threatened and endangered status. Um, if things aren't done, they tend to move towards an extinction point, and that's definitely not a good thing at all. Um, so when we're looking at these different groups of marine animals, you know, these are the IUCN numbers um, as of 2014. They reevaluate every three years. So 2017, they're compiling a report to then present it early 2018. But 234 different species of corals and other nadarians are sitting there as threatened um, threatened with extinction things like that I mean it's it's uh, it's not a pretty picture marine invertebrates we got about 68 there this is a big concern as well oh the marine fishes so you think about it how many of those fish those species of marine fish are commercially valuable how many of these things are something that people depend upon for an income that's a big problem uh five species of turtles we got one marine iguana 170 seabirds i mean that's a lot a lot of birds and you can keep going down the list here otters sea otters seals sea lions whales dolphins etc so Lots of marine species are sitting on this threatened and endangered list due to those issues we've talked about. You know, the, the habitat alteration and destruction, um, overfishing, overharvesting, acidification, you know, pollution. All these things are contributing to pushing these species towards threatened and endangered status. So uh, whales because of overfishing sharks 100 million of these poor guys a year are harvested and some of these species of sharks only give birth to one offspring maybe two and they only do it every couple years so it's just not sustainable at all um, we see sea turtles because of food people will harvest them for their shells and use their shells to make jewelry to make um, drums guitars etc Lots of corals are being threatened because of acidification, the change in the ocean temperature. And then, ooh, let's collect them. Let's sell them. Let's put them into the aquarium industry, uh, pet trade, things like that. So, again, lots and lots of problems here with imperiled. It was causing these different marine species to be put on the threatened and endangered list. Now, good things are being done. Let's talk about that. Let's let's focus on that. Um, conservation efforts. People recognize this. Lots of people recognize it. We see this, especially in Belize. They're very aware of the value of their marine resources, but there's still that pressure. Can we improve our economy? Can we provide health care and resources and education to our citizens while still trying to protect our resources? So, um, one thing that's being done, fisheries management systems are have been established and are being established in different countries to uh, look at, all right, what can we do here? What can we do to help manage this? Let's, First of all, let's make sure we're aware of it and then establish systems that regulate catch, that determine quotas and restrictions and things like that. Um, this is a big one to be proud of in Belize, the marine protected areas and the reserves. So you look at the map here, 
what they call MPAs, Marine Protected Areas. So check out the map. The blue here, this dark blue, all of these sections here, over here, 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 da, 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 all those dark blue sections are marine protected areas. So here's Glover's. Glover's Atoll is a protected area. This is Southwater Key right here. This whole thing right here. This is where we were at when we were spending most of our time in Belize. Turnafee Atoll is up here. This is Lighthouse Reef and Atoll over there. So they are aware of this. They know, wow, we need to protect this stuff. They've figured out how to manage it, how to protect it, and how to try to ensure that it is there for future generations. The challenge is the enforcement. So you can create all the laws you want, but if you don't have the resources to enforce it, people don't respect the laws. Now, the other challenge is, and I've seen this a lot of times in Belize, when we're looking at um, issues they have, the Belizeans may say, well, let's respect our laws, but then you get other countries. Unfortunately, we got Guatemala to the bottom here that will come in and disrespect the laws. Say, forget it. We don't care about those laws. We're going to do what we want. We're going to ignore it. And we're not going to um, respect the fact that Belize has these laws. So sadly, a lot of times you'll see boats from Guatemala coming up into the, per the reserves and fishing illegally. I have friends down there who have seen Guatemalan fishing boats go up to Lighthouse Reef. This is a World Heritage Site. And fish for sharks. Capture, kill sharks. And they, they unfortunately they just don't have the resources to protect everything. So that becomes a huge challenge. Okay, But other things. Let's go with other things that are being done. Um, habitat restoration. Can communities, coastal communities, go back in and try to restore habitat? Coral propagation. What we're looking at here are um, coral cages, ways to produce or create an artificial structure that allows the corals a place to grow. So you create these cages here, different shapes, varies, depends upon the environment and the waves, things like that. And then corals will naturally settle on it and can start to grow on their own. Or some programs exist where they actually will transplant and artificially attach corals to these things to start to develop a reef. That's one of the projects that we're going to be starting on down at, in Hopkins area is to work with habitat restoration and build artificial reefs to increase habitat and to try to, oh, to try to just replace what we can and restore and rebuild as much as possible. Okay, so there are a lot of things being done, but it takes effort, it takes resources, it takes recognition, and most importantly, let me, I want to move this stuff up here because I'm going to definitely point this one out. The biggest thing it takes education that is the biggest thing that it takes to make a difference here teach people the value of these resources teach people the importance of the marine ecosystem and not just the people living near it but everybody everybody needs to be aware of it so what can we do living thousands of miles away there's 10 easy things, 10 things to do to help with the marine ecosystem. You know, what we call carbon footprint and energy consumption. Insulate your home. It saves you money. It's good for the ocean. When you're eating seafood, sustainable seafood choices. 
Okay, huge thing. I'll show you guys a card that I would encourage you to print off, take with you, or save it on your phone. When you're out at a restaurant, you're going to get seafood. Flip it open, look at it, and say, okay, what's my best option here if I want to actually be helpful? Uh, plastic, reduce it. Gosh, let's reduce as much as we can. Reduce it, recycle it, minimize consumption. There is no excuse not to recycle in our country. It is readily available. Let's do everything we can for that. Um, if you guys are near a beach, accessing a beach, take care of it. Clean up the trash. Don't leave your trash. Try to minimize your impact upon it. Um, purchasing goods and products. Don't buy marine life. Don't buy corals. You know, look at things like that. If you are going to have pets, and they're going to be um, marine species, get the ones that are raised in a tank, bred in tanks, bred in fish tanks versus taken from the ocean. So be an ocean-friendly pet owner. Some of the foods we feed our animals, our pets are made from fish. Take a look at that. What kind of fish? Um, support organizations. Talk to people. If you're out there, and I encourage you to get out, get back in that ocean, be responsible. You know, educate yourself about it and other people. That's the bigger thing. You can make a difference, but then if you start educating one or two or five or ten other people, that adds up to something significant. Okay, so the last thing. Hey, go get some seafood. Go, and I don't discourage people from eating seafood. It's fantastic. It can be healthy. There's some great, great options out there. But choose smart. Choose wisely. So Monterey Bay Aquarium has this program, Seafood Watch, where they evaluate, are these things um, healthy? You know, are they going to contain pesticides or the biomagnification of pollution? And how are they harvested? You know, so always try to go with the green all the way to the left here, the green uh, list where we say, all right, let's really start with these over here. If we're going to go out and have um, clams and mussels and oysters, how are they harvested and where do they come from? If we're going to get crab, king crab, how is it harvested and collected? Lobster, things like that. You know, tilapia, shrimp, etc., scallops. You know, look, at, look at all the options here. I mean, there's plenty of different stuff here. So we're not, it's not like we're restricting our ability to have a good seafood meal. It's just, let's try to find some good choices. Um, with the alternatives, okay, so here's some options. But look into, how are they raised? How are they caught? How are, are they farmed or are they wild caught? What's going on there? You know, are those good things to be consuming? And then... If possible, we want to try to avoid some of these other species. You know, abalone. Get the farmed abalone. Yeah, tastes pretty much the same versus the abalone that's imported from China or Japan. Um, you know, can we avoid the Atlantic cod? Can we avoid crab coming from Asia and Russia? And the reason why we want to avoid these things, a lot of times they are overfished. Their populations are decreasing. They're not farmed in a sustainable way. The ways they're either caught or farmed can also be damaging to the environment. So if we can avoid those for different, better alternatives, it does make a difference. And absolutely, please, please, let me highlight this. Please don't ever eat shark meat. Don't do it. That's one of those things that we say, you know, it's just... They don't need another nail in their coffin or blow to them. Avoid shark. Yeah, just don't do it. All right, so we got an idea of what we're doing to the ocean. We also have an idea of what we can do to make some differences and changes. Hopefully everybody makes a little bit of a change, and all those changes add up. It took a lot of small changes to cause problems. A lot of small changes can make a good result.